forward to fort concho its why and wherefore this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales fort concho its why and wherefore by j n gregory forward many people who visit the fort concho museum and look over the parade ground and buildings of old fort concho naturally ask the question why did the united states government build a fort in this place and what did the fort accomplish the object of this pamphlet is to answer that question and to present the answer to the inquiring visitor at as small a cost as the printer makes possible two maps of texas will be found in the envelope at the back of the pamphlet the smaller is a reproduction of one published in eighteen fifty six not too accurate from a geographical standpoint but as accurate as the knowledge of the times allowed the other map accurate from the geographic point of view endeavors to show the locations of some thirty-four forts and camps that were established and built by our war department on the texas frontier during the indian days End of forward. part one of fort concho its why and wherefore by j n gregory this librivox recording is in the public domain the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo that brought to a close the war between the united states and mexico february two eighteen forty eight and the subsequent gadsden purchase of eighteen fifty three set the plan for the present boundaries between the two countries a vast area of plains deserts and mountains an unmapped and untraveled wilderness was now owned by the northern republic it was inhabited mostly by comanche apache kiowa and other warlike indian tribes and it stretched from the settlements of south and east texas and from the lower missouri river area to the new american settlements on the pacific coast great events were in the making when in california in eighteen forty eight gold nuggets were found in the tail race of sutter's mill the word passed around quickly and the first modern international gold rush was on it put the first sizable amounts of precious metals into the coffers of the nations of the world since the spanish conquistadores ransacked the treasure houses of peru and mexico it brought about modern mining practices and before the end of the century the search for gold was so international and intense that comparable strikes had been made in south africa australia canada and alaska resulting in fresh redistribution of populations not only in the united states but also in other portions of the world the problems accompanying such redistribution were plentiful and they are still plaguing us to this day but the lure that led men to our west was not gold alone the el dorado of man's dreams be it a gold vein oil patch store on main street cattle ranch or farm in peaceful valley can very well lie in any new and unexplored lands so it was then few men could afford for themselves families and belongings the cost of passage by sailing ship around the horn or by portage at the isthmus of panama from boston new york charleston new orleans galveston or indianola to san francisco besides that a fellow who was bent on making a trip liked to look over the country lying between home and his proposed destination so many found their el dorado not on the pacific coast but along the trails between the great river and the pacific ocean the inhabitants of the crowded east and the folks of the south felt their race-old urge to get on the move towards more freedom and opportunity old windy horace greeley was soon to advise go west young man so go west they did young and old first by small companies on horseback or in buckboards then later by trains of covered wagons which carried their families and all earthly possessions grouped together for companionship as well as for protection against the indians population movements in the united states have generally gone from east to west in parallel lines once the atlantic seaboard was settled 
and so this great gold movement from east to west brought settlement of the intermediate lands between the mississippi river and the pacific ocean by the natural contrasting types of north-south peoples the great oregon and santa fe trails serviced the people of the more northerly parts of our country but for those in the southern parts a newer trail had to be found and by simple geography it had to cross texas you could enter the state from the sea at galveston indianola or corpus christi or by way of the land through fort smith in arkansas thence across the indian territory to the red river or directly from louisiana through the fairly well settled and organized counties of east texas but no matter how you entered there was only one way to get out and so all trails converged on the paso del norte present el paso to get out of texas south of el paso would land you in mexico to get out north of el paso would take you across the llano estacado which in those days was considered a vast treeless plain unbroken by any topographic changes and completely devoid of water holes the accompanying map published in eighteen fifty six in yoakum's history of texas shows clearly the political subdivisions and settlements of texas in those times a substantial part of the state from the panhandle to the upper rio grande appears to be completely uninhabited and therefore politically unorganized in a vague manner this vast area might be assumed to be an unannexed portion of the counties of bexar el paso presidio and travis this map does not speak approvingly of the llano estacado staked plains some called it from eighteen forty eight on to the recent past various trail drivers army officers and railroaders laid out trails from the settled parts of texas to the paso del norte always taking advantage of springs and water holes and avoiding the llano estacado and the great limestone canyons of the rio grande and its tributaries that is all did but the builders of the southern pacific railroad they came later but yet too early to have the know-how of an arthur edward stillwell but that is another story a north-south trade route had existed for some two hundred years connecting spanish santa fe far north toward the headwaters of the rio grande south through the paso del norte to the settlements of the mother country of mexico the santa fe trail extended to california would cross this trade route at santa fe well up in the rocky mountains while the route through texas would cross it at el paso and so these two places became the supply dumps where the great wagon trains took on horses mules beef and other supplies that would see them across the final leg of the journey west it was a great opportunity for traders who had the supplies to sell and the procuring middleman the one who contacted both producer and merchant was a man with great savvy and ability known as the comanche indian the comanche despised walking it was not adaptable to his method of making a living he was a plains indian and somewhere back in the sixteenth or seventeenth century had somehow accumulated his first mustangs from offsprings of those horses lost by the conquistadors from spain prior to the arrival of the spaniards in america there were no horses as we recognize them now on either of the american continents now the comanche as a mounted man probably roamed the great plains from present wyoming to durango mexico it was easy to make a living on such a range it abounded in buffalo and the wise comanche knew all the water holes he drove the wily apaches to the south until they crossed the rio grande and settled in a quasi peaceful manner in mexico or later chose arizona and new mexico and preyed on the settlers immigrants and prospectors from the records the comanche does not appear to have been a breeder of horses cattle or sheep but as a procurer of such livestock he had no peer many years before lewis and clark were sent to evaluate the northwestern part of the louisiana purchase lands that mr jefferson had bought from napoleon bonaparte in eighteen o three the comanche had learned to find his greatest pleasure and profit during his daring raids into the settlements of mexico raiding in great force as far as south as the cities of chihuahua and durango the emotional inspiration for such forays on peaceful people was regarded as pure cussedness but a more profound study shows that the trophies of such raids 
excepting the scalps taken, were horses, cattle, sheep, and slaves. Many of the stolen horses were for the Comanche's personal use, because it took many animals to make the great raid during the Mexican moon. The balance of the trophies was used for barter. Years before the purchase of 1803, he was trading his stolen stock and possibly his slaves to the French traders from the Spanish-French border near Old Nacotish, pronounced Nacotish, on the lower Red River. Or in later times, upon return from a successful raid, he roared out of Mexico and across the Rio Grande into Texas, south of the Chisos Mountains. If short of war paint, he replenished his favorite red color from the outcroppings of Cinnabar near Terlingua Creek, then headed through the Badlands and out upon the range country by way of Persimmon Gap. From the Gap, he went to Comanche Springs, present Fort Stockton, crossed the Pecos River at Horsehead Crossing, then rode north to the sand dunes to water a famishing flock after which he headed east to the sulphur and the big spring then he turned northward around the cap rock that marks the eastern extremity of the terrible llano estacado to proceed on north until he actually scrambled out upon the plateau then he proceeded towards santa fe to meet somewhere possibly at casa amarillas in that then desolate region the comancheros or middlemen between himself and the mexican settlers of the upper rio grande valley near santa fe footnote one comancheros renegade mexicans half-breeds and outlaw americans who lived in mexican settlements in new mexico from whence they traveled in small bands usually by wagon or ox cart to the llano estacado where they met the comanches kiowas or other indians and traded guns ammunition whiskey and other desirable items for the products of the raids robert t neal san angelo texas End footnote he traded his trophies to the comancheros for guns ammunition or other less practical adjuncts that might suit his fancy of the moment his mexican moon was then over and he returned to his portable village which he had left in some watered canyon that cut down eastward from the llano estacado the route as followed by these indians was a well-marked trail and during the time of our westward migration it was well known and appears on the maps of the times Another route into Mexico broke off the western trail at the Big Spring and ran down the valley of the North Concho River across the Edwards Plateau, then through the passes of the Balcones Escarpment to cross the Rio Grande into Mexico near the present city of Eagle Pass. Mr. Evitz Haley refers to these trails as the Great Comanche War Trail and gives a wonderful description of the activity on them in his recent book, fort concho and the texas frontier an old map from the army files in the national archives calls the western branch the grand comanche war trail but call the trails what you may they were still a stiff pain in the neck to anyone crossing them and for the wagon trains and cattle herds going west crossing was inevitable the greater raids into mexico appeared to have occurred rather regularly in september when the weather was most favorable and the chief objectives could be struck during the light of a full moon thus to the unhappy but fully expectant mexicans the september full moon was known as the comanche moon at this time mars the red god of war hangs low and molten in the late summer night sky and reflects a light that is as red as the sand and clay soils of the indian territory another favorite trick of these versatile middlemen was to raid the settlements down the rio grande valley south from santa fe and drive off the stock to a rendezvous with the comancheros who in turn traded them to unknowing mexican settlers at other points on the river during such raids it was deemed ethical but unprofitable to kill the settlers since without them there would be no stock to drive off in a later raid besides these mexican settlers did not seriously molest the buffalo such business sagacity however did not apply in later times to the republic of texas where each succeeding year saw new settlers break ground and homestead farther up the river valleys whose streams had their origins in the motherland plains of the comanche and kiowa 
After its establishment in 1836, the infant republic found itself fighting a hot war on two fronts. The settlers near the Rio Grande, from Del Rio to the mouth of that river near Brownsville, suffered from raids out of Mexico by both Mexicans and Indians, while the northern prongs of the new settlements were exposed to the Comanches and Kiowas. It was a bitter struggle, fought generally in small isolated settlements, where the determined Anglo-Saxon fought for his new home against an equally determined Indian fighting to preserve his ancient homeland and range. A Saxon scalp decorating a Comanche's war shield might be avenged by an Indian's entire skin decorating a rude barn door. Matters were better controlled after the annexation of Texas by the United States and after the close of the Mexican War. But it took manpower and supplies to do it, something the new republic had been slow in acquiring. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo provided, among other things, that the United States would make every effort to keep the Indians from raiding into Mexico. So in about 1849, the United States Army, mostly cavalry and mounted infantrymen, uh, dragoons, moved into Texas. They proceeded to establish a string of forts and camps from previously established Brown, near the mouth of the Rio Grande, to Duncan, near Eagle Pass. For the upper Rio Grande in Texas, they set up what was later to be Fort Bliss, El Paso. As a northern line of defense for the settlers, they established, starting with Fort Duncan, the forts of Lincoln, Donis, Martin Scott, Fredericksburg, Grogan, Burnett, Gates, Gatesville, Graham, Hillsboro, and Worth, Fort Worth. Only a few of the forts were ever protected by stockades. The war was one of movement. The places were supposed to be strategically located and manned by several companies of cavalry and some infantry. Places from where punitive expeditions could set out, establish supply bases, and then try to run down the Indian raiders. The standing army of the United States during the 1850s was numbered at about 15,000 men, and the personnel of the Texas forts accounted for about from one-fifth to one-third of that number. Many of the officers and men were veterans of the Mexican War, the forts usually being named in honor of American soldiers who lost their lives in that war. Many Civil War leaders, both Confederate and Union, received much field training from 1849 to the outbreak of that war in 1861, building and manning the forts, chasing but seldom catching the Indians, guarding the wagon trains and mail bags, and exploring the wilderness for better trails and water holes. There is a record, one of many, left by the famous Captain Jack Hayes of the Texas Rangers. It tells how he was hired by certain merchants of San Antonio who were anxious to trade with the merchants of Chihuahua, Mexico. His assignment was to find in 1848 a route from San Antonio to privately owned Fort Leeton, where the Conchos River of Mexico meets the Rio Grande, and from which point to Chihuahua the going would be reasonably good. Hayes and his mounted company of frontiersmen managed to make it to Leeton and back to San Antonio, but they found the going so rough that the journey took them three and one-half months. Present Southern Pacific Railway west to Alpine. There were too many deep canyons along the tributaries of the Rio Grande. The decade following 1849 was most active. The Army detachments under capable officers explored to find routes from East Texas and from San Antonio to El Paso. But the wagon trains did not wait for their findings. They often made their own way and did their well-known creditable job. Mr. Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, and himself a distinguished veteran of the Mexican War, did about all in his power to aid the new state of Texas, the Mexican settlements, and the immigrant trains. He made treaties with the Indians and arranged reservations for them. This latter deal was not too successful. Friendly East Texas Indians almost starved on the reservations, and the more warlike Plains Indians had no idea of staying there even when they agreed to move in. The old men's tales of conquest and horse-stealing were more than the young bucks could take. 
Mr. Davis built new forts, and recognizing the great problems of communications that existed between such far-flung positions, sought to remedy those by importing, in 1856, through the seaport of Indianola, camels and their Arabian drivers. The camels were concentrated at Camp Verde in southern Kerr County, and breeding and testing immediately proceeded at a good pace. Tests for their strength and endurance carried the caravans across the Continental Divide and back, and the results were very gratifying. The Civil War put an end to the experiments. The last camel herd, before final sellouts to the carnivals, was privately owned near Austin in the early 1880s. By the time the Civil War broke out in 1861, the War Department had finally followed the advice of such able soldiers as Joe Johnston and Chase Whiting. The forts received a new alignment and were manned mostly by cavalry. Supplies were sent in, as before, from bases like San Antonio. The wagons, pulled by oxen or mules, were well guarded in most instances by soldiers. The contracts for furnishing the supplies and their transportation were let to civilians. The new alignment caused the abandonment of some interior forts and camps. The line on the lower Rio Grande was extended up the river by building Fort Hudson near the Devil's River, about 30 miles north of San Felipe. Out in far western Texas, they built Fort Quitman down the river from El Paso. Several things were done to discourage the Comanche and Kiowa, whose depredations along the Grand War Trail had been greatly stepped up. The War Department flanked the trail on the west by the building of a sizable establishment in a beautiful and romantic spot in the Davis Mountains, and named it Fort Davis in honor of the Secretary. Near this spot, more than three hundred years before, had passed the shipwrecked, unhorsed, and enslaved, but still valiant Spaniard Cabeza de Baca. He would later write in his report to his viceroy, describing his journey after leaving the great arid plains to the north, of a valley through which flowed limpid waters. Footnote 2. Perhaps this was Limpia Creek, Dr. R. T. Hill. End footnote. After Fort Davis, the department unveiled Fort Lancaster, western Crockett County, as a flanker to the east of the trail. It was cozily situated in the mesas, not far from the Pecos River, and beside Live Oak Creek that flows delightful spring water. Then the War Department built Fort Stockton, Pecos County, smack in the middle of the Grand Trail, and right beside the best spring water on its entire route. Now, to further protect immigrants and mailbags on the route west, and to protect settlers of central and northern Texas, who were still moving higher up the river valleys, it set up Fort Chadbourne as a pivot between the new western line and the lower Rio Grande Valley line. From Fort Chadbourne on northeasterly to the Indian Territory were Forts Phantom Hill, Abilene, and Belknap, New Castle. But Chadburn was a near miss, because it was not well located and its water supply was not adequate. However, not until the Civil War was over was it finally abandoned in 1867, and a new site chosen for its replacement at the confluence of the North, South, and Middle Concho Rivers. This new position would be called Fort Concho, and here eventually would be built the city of San Angelo. As the decade preceding the outbreak of the Civil War was closing, the great wagon trails from San Antonio and East Texas to El Paso must have been a sight to behold. Most of them converged on Castle Gap and the Horsehead Crossing of the Pecos River, from where they had a choice of two routes to El Paso. The California Overland Mail, Butterfield Overland Mail, 2,795 miles from St. Louis to San Francisco, entered Texas by way of Fort Smith, Arkansas, followed the line of forts southwesterly to the Middle Concho River, then turned westerly up that valley, then through Castle Gap to Horsehead Crossing. From here, the early route followed up the Pecos River to Pope's Crossing near the present Red Bluff Reservoir, thence westward to El Paso by way of Delaware Creek and Waco Tanks. A more southerly route from Horsehead Crossing was probably a better choice. 
it went from the crossing direct to fort stockton leon springs toyavale fort davis thence to van horn's well and el paso it also had the advantage of servicing the westerly line of forts the original run over this new mail route to california was made in eighteen fifty eight and the new york herald sent a special news correspondent one w l ormsby to be a through passenger on the mule-drawn coach so that he could report the trip the poor fellow was only twenty-three years old but age being in his favor he lived through it all his description of the trail from between the upper water holes of the middle concho river near present styles to castle gap and the horsehead crossing is most illuminating Quote, strewn along the road and far as the eye could reach along the plain decayed and decaying animals the bones of cattle and sometimes of men the hide drying on the skin in the arid atmosphere all told a fearful story of anguish and terrific death from the pangs of thirst for miles and miles these bones strew the plain End quote it appears from this on the spot observation that the trails across level plains country were very wide the wagon trains did not move in single file that would expose them too much to indian attacks and besides the longer the line the worse the dust the old wagon wheel ruts still noticeable to this day along the route described above by ormsby cover a wide area on the plains east of castle gap before they converge on that narrow pass these can be seen west of the china ponds where they move westerly about three miles south of the land grants known as the alphabet blocks given later by the state of texas to the corpus christi san diego and rio grande narrow gauge railroad try painting that one on a narrow gauge box car during eighteen fifty eight and eighteen fifty nine captain earl van dorn soon to be a member of the confederate high command vigorously carried the war to the indians and pushed them north back across the red river they didn't remain there long texas seceded from the union in eighteen sixty one and the federal soldiers marched out of the forts and left them to the confederate forces again the proper manpower was lacking some forts were abandoned so as to shorten the defence line and some of these as at lancaster were burned by the indians the indians now spurred on by union agents carried on a still more bloody and aggressive warfare on the texas frontier confederates and ranger companies coupled with frontiersmen reacted promptly and vigorously but it was a long line of defense from the red river to the rio grande defend it they did against the indians and against lawless elements such as deserters and other renegade hostile union sympathizers and border ruffians from without the state the negro slave was emancipated by proclamation in texas on june nineteenth eighteen sixty five juneteenth about two months after general lee surrendered the army of northern virginia at appomattox court house footnote three on june nineteenth eighteen sixty five major general gordon granger u s army landed at galveston and issued a general order declaring that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the united states all slaves are free End footnote. the last land battle of the civil war was fought on may thirteenth eighteen sixty five in cameron county texas when invading federal forces were routed near brownsville that engagement is known as the battle of palmito ranch End part one. Part two of Fort Concho, its why and wherefore, by J. N. Gregory. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From the end of the war until 1867, the frontier settlements had no organized military forces to protect them from the Indians, and it was against the law for Texans to carry guns added to this were the turmoils of reconstruction which were about as bitter in the populated parts of the state as they were in other parts of the south the occupying united states army under general phil sheridan was now mostly recruited from among the negroes and the army was not used against the indians until eighteen sixty seven when orders went out to get busy and put the forts and camps in order 
footnote four the negro regiments on the texas frontier during these indian times were the ninth and tenth cavalry and the twenty fourth and twenty fifth infantry End footnote. general sheridan's name was about as popular in virginia and texas as general w t sherman's was in georgia and mississippi but both sherman and sheridan came to texas and sherman after narrowly escaping the loss of his scalp on the texas frontier finally realized the necessity of a last organized military effort to either rid the country of the indians or give it back to them that was in eighteen seventy one however in eighteen sixty nine a new alignment of the forts had been seen as necessary never again reoccupied were certain of the interior ones such as worth graham gates crogan martin scott lincoln chadbourne and ewell la salle county fort belknap on the salt fork of the brazos river in young county had been the largest military post in north texas prior to the civil war in eighteen sixty seven the sixth cavalry was ordered to prepare it for reoccupation they worked for five months but then this fort was ordered evacuated and its place was taken by a new one fort griffin some thirty-seven miles up the clear fork of the brazos from belknap now to extend the northeasterly trending line of forts closer to the indian territory the army built fort richardson near the present town of jacksboro the site chosen as the replacement for fort chadburn to be called fort concho was at the confluence of the north concho river with the combined waters of the middle concho spring creek dove creek and the south concho the last three named streams being fed by bountiful springs this abundance of water and the geographically central location marked the spot as the natural convergence of trails from east northeast and south texas before they headed westward for horsehead crossing and el paso nature had been kind to this oasis in an otherwise desolate region the fishing was extremely good and the clear waters of the stream supported mussels the variety that produces gem pearls hence the spanish name of concho herds of buffalo grazed within sight of the new fort quail and turkey were plentiful the three new positions concho griffin and richardson located on a line two hundred and twenty miles long as yet unconnected by either telegraph or rail would soon be the centers of men supplies and animals for the campaigns that finally broke the concerted powers of the indians these campaigns carried the soldiers from the indian territory and the new mexico territory on the north to the actual interior of old mexico on the south from the times in eighteen sixty six and eighteen sixty seven when richardson and concho were ordered built until eighteen seventy one the troops undertook no organized campaigns against the indians the settlers suffered constantly and the indians learned new tricks many more learned how to live off government bounty on the reservations in indian territory then hit the warpath along with their wild brethren from the texas panhandle they were amply protected on their return to the reservations by the indian agents in charge who believed their wards could do no wrong why they would ask would an indian steal cattle when he had all the buffalo meat he wanted a cavalry expedition out of fort concho working the edges of the llano estacado in 1872 captured a comanchero who told how he and his companions traded the indian arms ammunition and supplies for cattle horses and sheep that they had stolen during their raids he even showed the soldiers the well-worn trails across the llano estacado toward santa fe and the valley of the rio grande thus the secret was finally revealed to the army it seems unbelievable at this time that such ignorance could prevail over the cries and protests of the texas ranchmen who were losing cattle by the tens of thousands footnote five during the civil war the cattle on the open texas ranges increased many fold with the loss by the confederacy of control of the mississippi river after that war they so far exceeded local demand that cattle drives on a much larger scale than ever before attempted got under way the chisholm and western trails from anywhere in texas on north through the western part of the indian territory entrained cattle in kansas for the eastern feedlots
the goodnight loving trail running west along the middle concho river thence north along the pecos and on parallel to the front ranges supplied cattle for the new ranches being opened from new mexico to the canadian border End footnote but such was the case and in eighteen sixty seven the comanches even stole horses from the post herd at fort concho we must remember that in that same year the mild policies of president andrew johnson in washington were overruled by the radicals in the united states congress and the bitter years of reconstruction followed for the southern states all former confederate soldiers were deprived of the vote and radicals carpetbaggers scalawags from the south and freed negroes ruled the state the army was used not to fight indians but to guard the new social system the prospect appeared brighter for the settlers when in the fall of eighteen sixty nine one hundred soldiers from fort concho managed to engage an indian force on the salt fork of the brazos river it was a drawn fight but immediately thereafter a larger force from the same fort engaged and defeated the indians in the same area texans were cheered by the news of this new tone of aggressiveness shown by the army it was the only way the war had to be carried to the indians the same way earl van dorn had carried the fight to them on the eve of the civil war but the time for real action had not arrived even as late as eighteen sixty nine on february eighteen eighteen seventy a citizen was killed and scalped within one quarter of a mile of the post limits at fort concho in january of the same year eighteen mules were stolen from the quartermaster's corral at that same post the same year eighteen seventy while colonel grierson was building fort sill in the indian territory chief kicking bird a kiowa defeated the command of captain c b mcclellan near the present town of seymour as late as march of eighteen seventy two a wagon train was waylaid near grierson springs in reagan county and the teamsters killed by the indians two companies of the ninth cavalry came upon the scene by accident engaged the indians but withdrew before a decision was reached footnote six captain lewis johnson twenty fourth infantry related quote, that was the year in which i changed stations twice marching from fort stockton all the way to fort brown on my way in march eighteen seventy two i think occurred an attack on a freight train at howard's well grierson springs reagan county it was a train from san antonio intended for fort stockton end quote. testimony before house committee on military affairs forty fifth congress second session washington d c december fourth eighteen seventy seven end footnote the lamentations of the border people were finally heard in washington and in april eighteen seventy one general w t sherman came to san antonio the next month, accompanied by General Randolph B. Marcy and an escort of seventeen men, he left for an inspection of the frontier. General Marcy was the same officer, then Captain Marcy, who in 1849 and later had played such an important part in exploring and reporting to Congress on trails through Texas. The great explorer was still an outdoor man of action the little expedition proceeded by way of Bern, fredericksburg the old spanish fort on the san saba which had withstood a great comanche indian siege in seventeen fifty eight fort mccavitt kickapoo springs and fort concho from fort concho it followed the military trail on northeasterly by the remains of fort chadburn and phantom hill and on towards belknap general marcy's journal is of great interest he relates Quote, we crossed immense herds of cattle today which are allowed to run wild upon the prairie and they multiply very rapidly the only attention the owners give them is to brand the calves and occasionally go out to see where they range the remains of several ranches were observed the occupants of which have either been killed or driven off to the more dense settlements by the indians indeed this rich and beautiful section does not contain today may seventeen eighteen seventy one as many white people as it did when i visited it eighteen years ago and if the indian marauders are not punished the whole country seems to be in a fair way of being totally depopulated he continues may eighteenth eighteen seventy one 
This morning five Teamsters, who with seven others had been with a mule wagon train en route to Fort Griffin, Captain Henry Warren's, with corn for the post, were attacked on the open prairie about ten miles east of Salt Creek by one hundred Indians, and seven of the Teamsters were killed and one wounded. General Sherman immediately ordered Colonel McKenzie to take a force of 150 cavalry with 30 days' rations on pack mules and pursue and chastise the marauders." End quote. An interesting angle to this affair was that Sherman's party had been observed by the same Indians who murdered the Teamsters, but were unmolested by them because they were waiting for the wagon train, which they considered nearer top priority. Sherman realized later that he had nearly lost his scalp. Footnote 7. The Salt Creek Massacre took place near the town of Graham. End footnote. This Colonel Mackenzie had reported in at Fort Concho as commanding officer on September 6, 1869. Born in New York, July 27, 1840, and christened Ronald Slidell, he had graduated first in his class at West Point in 1862. He served in the Union Army during the Civil War, received several wounds in action, and was a brigadier general when that war closed. The remainder of his professional life was devoted to active high command in the Indian Wars. At various times he served at Forts Brown, Clark, McAvitt, Concho, and Richardson, engaging in his last Indian fight at Willow Creek, Wyoming, in 1876. He was retired from the Army for disability in 1884 and died a bachelor at New Brighton, New York, in 1889. Along with Mackenzie, Colonel William Rufus Shafter, who arrived to command at Fort Concho in January 1870, the War Department had its two best young officers serving in the West Texas Theater. Shafter had no West Point training. Born in Michigan on October 16, 1835, he entered the Union Army in the Civil War as a first lieutenant, and by the end of that war had been breveted Brigadier General of Volunteers. He was later awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for service during the war. He was commissioned Lieutenant Colonel of Regulars in 1869 and first saw service in West Texas with the 24th Infantry at Fort McAvitt. Later in life, he was to command the American armies in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. During the summer of 1871, while commanding forces at Fort Davis, he set out with cavalry from both Forts Davis and Stockton and pursued a large raiding party of Indians from the Fort Davis area northeasterly until the trail moved into the great sand dune country near where the city of Monahans now stands. He spent 14 days in this pursuit, but as was usual in such matters, could never force an engagement. However, he learned that the heretofore dreaded sand dunes contained fresh water a few feet below the surface in several places, and that the area was a great refuge for Indians and was one of those rendezvous where horse and cattle stealing Indians met the Comanchero traders from New Mexico. The command at Fort Concho, as at the other forts, rotated in a perpetual manner. After service elsewhere, Mackenzie returned to Concho to organize five companies of the 4th Cavalry and a headquarters company for service at Fort Richardson, nearer the Indian Territory. His column moved out March 27, 1871, cavalry, pack mules, and wagons. The bachelor commander even allowed wives of the men to accompany the expedition as far as the new headquarters at Fort Richardson. The weather was crisp and cold as they forded the North Concho and soon passed Mount Margaret, named after the most accomplished, loving, and devoted wife of one of our favorite captains, E. B. Beaumont. Beaumont, beautiful mountain. So wrote Captain Robert G. Carter, historian and winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor in the Indian Wars, who was a member of the expedition. Mount Margaret is the outstanding hill at Tennyson. They pitched camp the first night at Old Fort Chadburn, from where they followed the military trail, passing en route huge herds of buffalo as they went on by Forts Phantom Hill, Belknap, and on into Richardson. <laughs> 
Two months later, in May, Colonel Mackenzie roused his 4th Cavalry at Fort Richardson and set out to obey General Sherman's orders issued after the killing of the Teamsters at Salt Creek. But it began to rain. After a futile chase, Colonel Mackenzie headed for Fort Sill, commanded by Colonel Benjamin H. Grierson. There he learned that Sherman had left, but not before the chiefs Satank, Sitting Bear, Big Tree, and Satanta, White Bear, had returned to the reservation at Sill and boasted of murdering the Teamsters. Mackenzie arrested and escorted the three Indians to Jacksboro for trial in the Texas court. Satank purposely got himself killed by a guard on the march, but Satanta and Big Tree were later sentenced to prison in the state penitentiary at Huntsville. The duplicity of these reservation Indians should now have been apparent to even Grierson and the Indian lovers in Washington and Austin, but it was not. A good insight into the Indian problem of the times, and of which we have a written record, appeared at the trial of the two Indian chiefs during July of 1871 in the little log courthouse on the public square of Jacksboro. Charles Soward was the presiding judge, Samuel W. T. Lanham, later to be a two-term governor of Texas, was the district attorney. The court appointed Thomas Fall and Joe Woolfolk of the Weatherford Bar to represent the defendants. Thomas Williams, the foreman of the jury, was a frontier citizen and a brother of the governor of Indiana. The principal witnesses against the defendants were Colonel Mackenzie, Lowry or Lowry, Tatum, the Indian agent who had heard their statements at Fort Sill, and Thomas Brazil, the teamster who had escaped from the Salt Creek massacres. Our Captain Carter wrote, quote, Under a strong guard, accompanied by his counsel and an interpreter, the chief, clanking his chain, walked to the little log courthouse on the public square. The jury had been impaneled, and the district attorney bustled and flourished around. The whole country, armed to the teeth, crowded the courthouse and stood outside, listening through the open windows. The chief's attorneys made a plea for him and referred to the wrongs the red man had suffered, how he had been cheated and despoiled of his lands and driven westward until it seemed there was no limit to the greed of the white man. They excused his crime as just retaliation for centuries of wrong. The jurors sat on long benches, each in his shirt sleeves and with shooting irons strapped to his hip." End quote. Satanta got up to defend himself before his accusers. Over six feet tall, the perfect figure of an athlete, and well known as the orator of the plains who could sway counsels of both whites and Indians, he could well have influenced the jury by mute silence, but instead he lied and dissembled to save his life. He never mentioned the wrongs done his people by the whites. Instead, speaking through the interpreter, he proceeded as follows. Quote, I have never been so near the Tahanas, Texans, before. I look around me and see your braves, squaws, and papooses, and I have said in my heart, if I ever get back to my people, I will never make war upon you. I have always been the friend of the white man, ever since I was so high, indicating by sign the height of a boy. My tribe have taunted me and called me a squaw, because I have been the friend of the Tahanas. I am suffering now for the crimes of bad Indians, of Satank and Lone Wolf and Kicking Bird and Big Bow and Fast Bear and Eagle Heart, and if you will let me go, I will kill the three latter with my own hand." End quote. The evidence against the two chiefs was debated by the jury, and both were sentenced to death. The sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. Now a few statements from the court record as to what the district attorney had to say point to some of the misunderstandings of the times when it came to the Indian problem on the western frontiers. The following excerpts from his plea before the court show clearly not only the feeling of the frontiersmen towards the uncontrolled Indians, but also the contempt in which they, both frontiersmen and Indians, held the people who by appeasement crookedness and ignorance tried to manage the Indian affairs of the nation from a far away city. Quote, Satanta, the veteran council chief of the Kiowas, the orator, the diplomat, the counselor of his tribe, 
the pulse of his race. Big Tree, the young war chief, who leads in the thickest of the fight and follows no one in the chase. The mighty warrior with the speed of the deer and the eye of the eagle are before this bar in the charge of the law. So they would be described by Indian admirers who live in more secured and favored lands remote from the frontier, where distance lends enchantment to the imagination, where the story of Pocahontas and the speech of Logan the Mingo are read and the dread sound of the war hoop is not heard. We who see them today, disrobed of all their fancied graces, exposed in the light of reality, behold them through far different lenses. We recognize in Satanta the arch-fiend of treachery and blood, the cunning Catiline, the promoter of strife, the breaker of treaties signed by his own hand, the inciter of his fellows to rapine and murder, as well as the most canting and double-tongued hypocrite where detected and overcome. In Big Tree we perceive the tiger demon who tasted blood and loved it as his own food, who stops at no crime, how black soever, who is swift at every species of ferocity, and pities not at any sight of agony or death. He can scalp, burn, torture, mangle, and deface his victims with all the superlatives of cruelty, and have no feeling of sympathy or remorse. We look in vain to see in them anything to be admired or even endured. Powerful legislative influences have been brought to bear to procure for them annuities, reservations, and supplies. Federal munificence has fostered and nourished them, fed and clothed them. From their strongholds of protection they have come down upon us like wolves on the fold. Treaties have been solemnly made with them, wherein they have been considered with all the formalities of quasi-nationalities. Immense financial rings have had their origin in, and draw their vitality from, the Indian question. Unblushing corruption has stalked abroad, created and kept alive, through the poor Indian whose untutored mind sees a god in clouds or hears him in the wind. For many years predatory and numerous bands of these pets of the government have waged the most relentless and heart-rending warfare upon our frontier, stealing our property and killing our citizens. We have cried aloud for help. It is a fact well known in Texas that stolen property has been traced to the very doors of the reservation and there identified by our people to no purpose. End quote. Mackenzie realized those things and knew he could receive no cooperation from Grierson at Fort Sill. So in September, acting on orders, concentrated a force of eight companies of the 4th Cavalry, two companies of the 11th Infantry, and 30 Tonkawa Indian scouts at Old Camp Cooper near Fort Griffin. The infantry would be used to guard the supply bases as he moved northwesterly in the hope of engaging the wild brethren under Chief Quana. He bivouacked in the mouth of Blanco Canyon and lost sixty-odd horses to an Indian raid that night. The next day the command moved up the canyon and later came out on the flat prairie of the Llano Estacado. A large retreating body of Indians was sighted, but a norther blew up, and Mackenzie was forced back down the canyon by the cold weather. He withdrew to Fort Richardson, where the command arrived in late November. He accomplished nothing, and as for himself, he received an arrow wound during a small skirmish in the canyon. End of Part 2 Part three of Fort Concho, its why and wherefore, by J. N. Gregory. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With the coming of spring, things picked up. Mackenzie received orders in May to establish a camp of cavalry and infantry on the fresh fork of the Brazos, from which his cavalry should operate in pursuit of hostile Indians. He moved out of Fort Richardson in June, while Shafter at Fort Concho organized wagon trains and supplies, these coming from as far away as Fort Brown. He was to meet Mackenzie near the mouth of Blanco Canyon, where the base was to be established. By September 1872, Mackenzie and his cavalry had moved from Blanco Canyon to Fort Sumner, New Mexico, 
thence north to fort bascom new mexico then southeasterly to palo duro canyon and south to his base camp at blanco canyon he had found no indians or comancheros but he had followed well-marked comanchero trails across the llano estacado and had no trouble in finding water holes the staked plains were not nearly so tough as the high army echelons had been led to believe puzzled by the lack of indians he set out for the headwaters of the red river and on september twenty nine discovered a large camp on a tributary of the red northeast of palo duro he immediately attacked with five companies of cavalry routed the braves burned two hundred and sixty two indian lodges and captured a hundred and twenty seven women and children and an estimated three thousand head of horses his own losses were light if we accept the fact that the indian braves returned that night and recovered all of their horses by stampeding them mackenzie never forgot that midnight raid the drubbing had a salutary effect on the indians the captives were sent to fort concho for prisoner exchange and many warriors sought safety on the reservations their chief satank was dead and chief satanta and big tree were in the penitentiary at huntsville the next spring the remaining one hundred captive women and children at fort concho were delivered back to the reservation at fort sill amid great rejoicing by the braves they began to feel that the pale face was not such a bad hombre after all Evett Haley says that some of the braves so seriously considered settling down that they even sent their women into the fields to see what work was like. Things now looked better, and the Indian lovers persuaded Governor Edmund J. Davis to issue pardons to Satanta and Big Tree. This infuriated General Sherman. That was in April of 1873. Trouble immediately started again but meanwhile mackenzie had returned to fort concho where he arrived in january of that year and set up the headquarters of the fourth cavalry regiment then in march the fourth itself left fort richardson for concho and the seventh cavalry took over at richardson footnote eight when at the battle of the little bighorn in present montana june twenty five eighteen seventy six general george a custer and his entire command were massacred by the sioux indians that command was composed of elements of the seventh united states cavalry the massacre took place about three years after the seventh marched into fort richardson there is no evidence of custer having been at richardson at this time he was probably somewhere on the missouri river End footnote the fourth headed for fort concho the same column soldiers wagons wives and their household plunder that had moved north to richardson two years before general sherman had decided to do something about that other texas frontier the rio grande and he wanted mackenzie with his fourth cavalry to handle the job things were not and never had been peaceful along the rio grande it was another frontier with two parts from ringgold barracks opposite the mexican city of camago on down to the mouth of the rio grande a man by the name of juan cortina once a general in the mexican army that had opposed general zachary taylor's invasion of mexico sought to make a living in the grand style he was very successful as a bandit and became the robin hood of his side of the border during the civil war his banditry ceased he became a trader and did well because the rio grande became the only outlet of the southern confederacy but with the close of the war he resumed his favorite role as a bandit and declared that the nueces river and not the rio grande was the border between his country and the united states the result was that he and other lesser bandits overran the entire country from the rio grande to the nueces killed for the pleasure of killing and drove into mexico tens of thousands of texas cattle in eighteen seventy five one of his raids came within seven miles of corpus christi truly his activities were as fearsome and as costly as were those of the indians on the other frontiers of the state but the united states army did little about it being unable to catch raiders in texas and unwilling to attack them in mexico the texas rangers recreated in eighteen seventy four began to effectually take care of the matter Thirty-one of these men, under their able commander, Captain Leander H. McNelly, began to take a bite out of these raiders in 1875, killing them not only in Texas, but pursuing and attacking them in Mexico itself. 
general porfirio diaz came to power in mexico about this time and ended the cortina troubles by arresting and confining that gentleman to the environs of mexico city the rangers took care of the rest of the gangs along the upper rio grande the raids into texas were made by indians the kickapoos lipans and apaches these tribes had settled in that great arid and sparsely inhabited area that extends south of the rio grande from laredo to el paso that part of mexico was a no-man's land the small mexican and indian villages were a law unto themselves the mexicans often joined the indians on their raids and the cattle and horses brought back found a ready market in the mexican villages the lipans like the apaches were natives of the great plains country the kickapoos were easterners and had been termed friendly indians upon their arrival west of the mississippi river the term friendly indian often used in writings and reports of the times referred in the larger sense to those tribes such as the kickapoos cherokees choctaws chickasaws seminoles delawares and others that had once been powerful tribes in the eastern united states but because of the encroachment of the white settlers they had by treaty coercion or force during the early eighteen hundreds been continually moved by the united states government from their ancestral or reservation lands in the east they finally ended up at various times on reservations assigned to them in what is now kansas and oklahoma indian territory here they usually encountered hostility from the native tribes of the great plains whose superior numbers threatened their entire existence they were considered intruders and were obliged to turn to the united states troops where possible for protection their natural ability as trackers made them a necessary unit in any force of troops that sought to engage hostile indians the seminoles from florida were pretty well mixed with negro blood upon their arrival in east texas and later in the indian territory the reason for this was that prior to the civil war many runaway negro slaves had sought and found sanctuary among these indians living at that time in the fastnesses of the everglades during the latter days of the civil war december of eighteen sixty four a company of frontier scouts out of fort belknap discovered a freshly abandoned indian camp west of the ruins of old fort phantom hill the scouts estimated that perhaps five thousand indians had camped there during the preceding fall comanche and kiowa indians in large numbers had broken up the settlements on the northern frontier in young county therefore it was assumed and assumed too hastily as it turned out that these indians had occupied the camp and were on the march to find a permanent spring and summer location from where they could further raid the settlements actually these indians were friendly kickapoos from the indian territory and as it turned out they were probably peacefully moving themselves and their entire tribe to join a tiny remnant of the tribe that had years before settled in old mexico some forty miles west of laredo the hasty assumption that these indians were hostile led to the battle of dove creek fought on sunday the eighth of january eighteen sixty five the scene of the battle was the indian encampment on the south bank of dove creek about three miles above its confluence with spring creek and fifteen miles southwest of the present tom green county courthouse after the discovery of the abandoned camp near phantom hill the indians were trailed by scouts confederate regulars had been concentrated at camp colorado and militia had been moved from erath brown comanche and parker counties these two columns of troops numbering some four hundred men concentrated above the indian encampment before daybreak they attacked at daylight it was an impetuous charge and was met by deadly fire from the infield rifles of six hundred braves well protected by the underbrush of the creek bottom the militia respectfully referred to by the regulars as the flop-eared militia suffered heavily in their charge they broke and fled and were of no more value in the field the regulars now badly outnumbered and outflanked were slowly forced back and withdrew towards spring creek fighting from the shelters of the oak groves as they retired this action continued all day and they encamped that night with all their wounded and the reformed militia on spring creek about eight miles from the original battleground 
they left twenty-two dead on the field and carried away about forty wounded the long retreat to the mouth of the concho river started the next morning in a blinding snowstorm that made pursuit by the indians impossible they resorted to captured indian ponies as food supply it had been a most unfortunate affair the kickapoos crossed the mexican border in the eagle pass area and settled down about forty miles inland always irked by memories of the unprovoked dove creek fight they thereafter heartily joined future raids into texas they were no longer friendly indians it was this matter of raids into texas in the upper rio grande country that attracted general sherman's attention in march of eighteen seventy three when he ordered colonel mackenzie and his fourth cavalry to fort concho from concho they moved to fort clark only about thirty miles from the mexican border at fort clark a conference of high-ranking officials was held including apparently the secretary of war general phil sheridan mackenzie and others no orders were issued but after the conference was over the brass reviewed the fourth cavalry the ten-year men in the regiment knew that something big was brewing dark and early on the morning of may seventeenth eighteen seventy three colonel mackenzie led four hundred men of his fourth cavalry and twenty or thirty seminole scouts under lieutenant john l bullis on a drive across the rio grande into mexico after four days and nights of continuous riding and fighting the small expeditionary force carrying their supplies in their pockets and with no time taken out for sleeping recrossed the river and were back on friendly texas soil they had covered some one hundred and sixty miles and had burned three kickapoo and lipan villages killed a considerable number of braves captured forty women and children plus the chief of the lipans and had driven the remainder of the tribes into the santa rosa mountains washington and mexico city both hit the ceiling over this invasion of a friendly nation mackenzie could show no written orders for the action had he failed he would have been court-martialed and he knew that beforehand but president grant stood by his officer and the incident soon blew over in fact a year or two later most of the remaining kickapoos were persuaded to accept uncle sam's hospitality they went from mexico to fort sill by way of fort concho and were given a cozy place on a reservation in the indian territory footnote nine this action was not a pursuit following a fresh trail into mexico it was a carefully planned attack on indian villages in that country the locations of which had been accurately ascertained beforehand later on during eighteen seventy six and eighteen seventy seven lieutenant john l bullis acting under the command of colonel shafter conducted six such raids into mexico all on the upper rio grande from laredo to points southwest of the mouth of the pecos river bullis was a very brave and competent soldier and was awarded a sword by the texas legislature camp bullis near san antonio was named for him in nineteen seventeen End footnote. by this time it is apparent that our colonel mackenzie was the fair-haired boy of president grant and generals sherman and sheridan during the civil war grant had regarded him as his ablest young officer now if things got out of line you would simply dress on bobs truly things were about to get out of line again some foolish policy of appeasement was still rampant in washington so satanta and big tree were released from the penitentiary this combined with other factors such as the restlessness of the indians on the reservations and the slaughter of the buffalo united the efforts of the comanche tribe along with the kiowas now aided by the cheyennes they started trouble all over again once more the raids during the spring of eighteen seventy four hit the texas frontier and as usual the soldiers while sleeping had their horses stolen buffalo hunters in their lonely camps on the panhandle plains were murdered and scalped just east of the old adobe walls ruins on the north side of the canadian river in what is now northeastern hutchison county twenty-eight men and one woman fortified themselves in three new adobe buildings that had just been completed as a trading post in anticipation of the northern migration of the great buffalo herds they had awakened before daylight on the morning of june twenty seventh eighteen seventy four by a sharp cracking noise 
the newly cut cottonwood ridge pole that supported the roof on one of the three buildings had settled and the sod-covered roof threatened to collapse at any moment fifteen men worked until daylight propping up the roof that accident saved the lives of all in the walls for just as daylight came being awake and outside they saw to the eastward an estimated seven hundred mounted indians riding hard for the settlement the attacking force was less than half a mile away when it deployed in a great converging arc billy dixon the buffalo hunter and frontier scout described the charge in a dramatic manner Quote, there was never a more splendidly barbaric sight in after years i was glad that i had seen it hundreds of warriors the flower of the fighting men of the southwestern plains tribes mounted upon their finest horses armed with guns and lances and carrying heavy shields of thick buffalo hide were coming like the wind over all was splashed the rich colors of red vermilion and ochre on the bodies of the men on the bodies of the running horses scalps dangled from bridles gorgeous war bonnets fluttered their plumes bright feathers dangled from the tails and manes of the horses and the bronzed half-naked bodies of the riders glittered with ornaments of silver and brass behind this headlong charging host stretched the plains on whose horizon the rising sun was lifting its morning fires the warriors seemed to emerge from this glorious background End quote life of billy dixon by olive k dixon the southwest press dallas texas the three buildings were about equally manned by the whites doors were closed and then barricaded as were the windows and transoms by sacks of flour and grain the first charge was broken up at the very walls of the building by the lead from the big buffalo guns thanks to the thick abode walls and to the dirt covered roofs there was no danger of being smoked out by fire the fight raged until noon two of the whites unable to reach the buildings had been killed in the first onslaught all of the horses and oxen were dead or driven away the indians had lost heavily and now withdrew out of range they could be seen moving about in the distance but they did not attack again it was on the third day of the siege that billy dixon drew a bead on a mounted indian one thousand five hundred and thirty eight yards away on a ridge and shot him dead he was firing a fifty caliber sharps rifle the largest of the buffalo guns during the next two or three days other buffalo hunters drifted into the walls until the garrison numbered about a hundred men william barclay bat masterson had been present since the beginning of the fight and had like most of the other defenders distinguished himself by his cool behavior under fire by the end of the sixth day the indians had broken up into bands the comanches under quana the kiowas under lone wolf and the cheyennes under stone calf and white shield these bands then proceeded to work over the other buffalo hunters on the south and central ranges they accomplished their objective buffalo hunting by the whites was discontinued for that year down in san antonio general christopher c auger the department commander fully backed by general sherman ordered full-scale war all indians off their reservations were declared hostiles and the campaign against them took the form of a real squeeze play it was relentlessly carried out by a man-sized army under able lieutenants colonel nelson a miles was ordered to march westerly out of camp supply in the indian territory colonel john Wynne davidson was to move west out of fort sill major william r price was to move down the canadian out of fort union territory of new mexico colonel g p buell was to leave fort griffin proceed north to the red river then move up that stream and colonel mackenzie's command headed northwesterly out of fort concho for his old camping ground at blanco canyon it appears that colonel grierson was left out altogether the campaign got under way in the late summer of eighteen seventy four colonel mackenzie marched out of fort concho with eight companies of cavalry and three of infantry he moved northwesterly up the north concho river for his first objective the camp at blanco canyon footnote ten a regiment of cavalry on the texas frontier after the civil war could at maximum strength muster about nine hundred and twenty nine men 
a company of maximum strength could muster about ninety men a regiment of infantry varied in number more than a similar cavalry unit and was smaller mustering generally about four hundred and sixty men while a company varied from twenty-five or thirty men on up to sixty or sixty-five men End footnote. mackenzie appears to have been overall commander however the biography of nelson a miles seems to give miles considerable credit for subduing the indians in our west he was a volunteer in the union army during the civil war and rose to high rank higher than that reached by mackenzie biographies can often be misleading parts of them being word-of-mouth stories from the principal himself miles could never have been called a modest man prior to his death he followed the example of some of the pharaohs of egyptian history and built his mausoleum on the bank of a great river in his case not the nile but the potomac it was perfectly legal to do this the site chosen being in the arlington national cemetery a place reserved for the remains of united states servicemen however the timing of the construction of the mausoleum built even before he died and the fact that he chose to plant himself not only in the most prominent spot to be found but right in what had once been general robert e lee's front yard leads one to believe he might have taken a slight advantage of his biographer the campaign lasted until the latter part of december eighteen seventy four when through ice and snow mackenzie's fourth cavalry drifted into fort griffin by this time the other commanders had accomplished their objectives and returned to their stations the strategy had been simple enough the commands from the north east and west were to drive the tribes towards the rough country and the canyons in the headwaters of the red river where mackenzie moving in from the south would destroy them the actual carrying out of the plans was as usual another thing variations in the weather were severe drinking water was scarce and when found usually had the same effects on the drinkers as would castor oil wood for fires was generally lacking corn for horse was an eternal problem and the long supply lines were constantly threatened by an alert enemy but it all worked out as planned the four commanders miles buell davidson and price drove the tribes before them after spirited engagements on october ninth buell moving up the red river destroyed a camp of four hundred lodges on the salt fork of that river the usual plan of operation was for each commander to use his friendly indian scouts as guides to locate a fresh indian trail after that it was hard riding and if possible surprise attack on a village most of the supplies came from the nearest forts such as sill fort bascom new mexico and camp supply in the northwestern part of the indian territory and fort griffin on the brazos it was during this campaign that plans were made to locate fort elliott as a new defense in the panhandle footnote eleven quote, a large trade has sprung up in western texas in cattle which are driven up into kansas to the railroad at or near fort dodge they go up by what is termed the panhandle of texas fort elliott is established there for the purpose of aiding cattle merchants who buy cattle in texas and drive them up to the railroad and thence the cattle are taken to ohio or illinois and fed until spring when they are sent east the trade amounts to two or three hundred thousand annually end quote statement of general w t sherman november twenty one eighteen seventy seven before the committee on military affairs in relation to the texas border troubles house of representatives forty fifth congress second session End footnote. mackenzie's fourth cavalry moved many a weary mile his biggest indian fight occurred in the palo duro canyon where he surprised a large camp in late september and reported the capture of one thousand four hundred and twenty four ponies mules and colts remembering his past experience with captive horses he had the entire herd shot rather than risk the possibility of their recapture during the night by the braves this campaign broke up any further concerted action by the indian tribes it had been long in materializing and that to many still seems hard to understand satanta was recaptured and sent back to the penitentiary at huntsville but ended it all a short time thereafter by jumping head first out of a second-story window 
the other kiowa chief big tree upon being captured and imprisoned this time at fort sill became a model prisoner after gaining his freedom he became the kiowa's principal chief caused a little trouble in eighteen ninety that was squelched without bloodshed by the soldiers and he then settled in a cottage near mountain view oklahoma he died a deacon in the baptist church november eighteenth nineteen twenty nine however much the comanche tribes might by now be reduced in number their spirits remained high and restless on their reservations as late as eighteen seventy eight and eighteen seventy nine small war parties raided as deep into texas as fort mccabot but there was no coordinated action the extinction of the buffalo on our southern region was completed about 1878, and then the hunters turned in force against the remaining herds on the northern parts of the Great Plains. These herds lasted about four more years. The men in the forts could be, and were, still busy. Colonel Grierson took over at Concho in 1875. That same year, Colonel Shafter, with nine troops of the 10th Cavalry and two companies of infantry, left after rendezvousing at that post and headed for the Indian country near Blanco Canyon. His supply train consisted of 65 wagons drawn by six mule teams, a pack train of nearly 700 mules, and a beef herd. This was in July. Good rains had fallen and water holes were expected to be full it took the expedition seventeen days to cover the hundred and eighty miles the author cannot verify the reported strength of the mule train only a few indians were met so shafter divided his command his own division out of fort duncan returned to that post about december eighteenth eighteen seventy five after having explored the country now known as the south plains of texas and new mexico one of his lieutenants, Geddes, leading a division from Mustang Springs, near present Midland, on south to cross the Pecos on a southwesterly course below Independence Creek, reached the Rio Grande. There they engaged in a small Indian fight, then retraced their steps to avoid the Great Canyon country, crossed the Pecos, and in a worn-out condition reached Fort Clark. Geddes then rested up and returned to Fort Concho. The entire expedition had explored and mapped what had been a vast and unknown area, and had encountered only a few wandering bands of Indians. It appeared that the Indian problems had at last been solved. However, the final settlement of that problem came in 1880. An Apache chief, one Victorio, long confined to a reservation in the territory of New Mexico, hit the warpath with all of his tribe and their belongings, warriors, squaws, papooses, and portable lodges. Colonel Grierson, now General Grierson, left Fort Concho and with detachments from Forts Concho, Stockton, Davis, and Quitman, sought to force an engagement in that wild and mountainous and desert land that lies on both sides of the Rio Grande from El Paso on the west to the Davis Mountains on the east. The United States cavalry was no match for the elusive Victorio, who avoided any but guerrilla action, and worked back and forth across the Rio Grande until Grierson, disgusted, returned to Fort Concho. His forces had not been allowed to cross into Mexico, and he thought that the mexican forces also chasing the apaches had not fully cooperated with him this may or may not have been so but the end of the new war came in the fall when general terrazas then governor of chihuahua forced an engagement by trapping and surrounding the old chief only a few survivors were able to escape this well-planned but short campaign by the mexican forces the usefulness of the forts, so far as protection against the Indians was concerned, now ended. The accompanying map shows their relative locations and the dates on which they were organized and abandoned. Only one, Fort Bliss at the Paso del Norte, serves the United States Army at this time. Fort Concho remained active until 1889, but it was only another army post small parties of indians roamed the frontier even in the eighties but the texas rangers and the frontiersmen took care of them of all of those that were abandoned during the last century fort concho is the best preserved 
it took time to build it and when finally abandoned its lovely stone buildings and the land on which they stand reverted to the original landowners adams and wicks the united states army having been only a rent-paying tenant just what do some of the others look like at this time fort worth is covered somewhere under a modern city that bears its name the foundations of old fort mason can be seen on a hill within the city limits of mason the cut stones of its buildings having been removed for construction work elsewhere the same goes for old lancaster where only a few gaunt white limestone chimneys can be seen rising against the mesas however if you care to walk over to them you will see the old foundations and a small graveyard that is all that is left if a comanche or kiowa indian observed fort phantom hill today for the first time he would probably name it many chimneys that do not smoke the buildings are gone and he would not be interested in their foundations some of the limestone houses at fort mcavitt are still being occupied and many of the other old fort buildings are outlined by roofless walls several of the original buildings of fort stockton still remain and have been converted into gracious homes fort davis is a line of stone and adobe shells the timbers of the overhanging porches being long gone except where the late andrew simmons restored a few and built a creditable museum in one building fort clark rising by the beautiful las moras springs is a combination of the old and the new having seen service in the last world war it is interesting to observe that in its case it is unfortunately the new and not the old that is missing the old spanish fort presidio on the san saba river enough of the rubble remains to outline the outer wall of the large courtyard this was a massive stone fortification and each of its four corners was protected by a protruding circular stone tower the state highway department has restored one of the towers and a part of the outer wall the old mission san saba de la cruz across and down the river from this presidio disappeared along with its administering priests during the great comanche attack against the spaniards and their apache allies back in seventeen fifty eight or thereabout the preservation of the existing buildings of fort concho and the restoration of the destroyed ones were begun in nineteen thirty by mrs ginevra wood carson a gracious and far-sighted lady of san angelo she had already started the west texas museum in about nineteen twenty eight and it was located in the new tom green county courthouse where it soon outgrew its housing facilities she therefore turned her attention towards the old fort the original administration or ghq building of fort concho was privately owned but in excellent condition and it stood at the eastern end of the old quadrangle mr r wilbur brown senior of san angelo recognized the far-sightedness of mrs carson he bought the administration building from its owners and deeded it toward a museum of pioneer days and the preservation of old fort concho mrs carson then moved the museum collection from the courthouse into the administration building and changed the name of west texas museum to fort concho museum the history of fort concho since its abandonment in eighteen eighty nine when the garrison lowered the flag for the last time and marched away its band playing the girl i left behind me had not been spectacular it could easily have become a rock quarry as had lancaster mason and others actually some of the barracks buildings on the north side of the quadrangle did suffer that inglorious fate but the houses on officers row the administration building hospital and chapel were for many years the finest buildings in the surrounding area in 1905 the concho realty company was formed by certain citizens of san angelo and the fort grounds with all the structures were bought by the company from the adams and wicks estate for fifteen thousand dollars a real estate addition was then organized and the various buildings sold to private individuals the most elaborate of these had been the post hospital it occupied a position outside and just off the southeast corner of the quadrangle this building burned in nineteen ten and some years later its remaining stone walls partitions and chimneys were cleared away End of part three.
Part 4, Afterward of Fort Concho, Its Why and Wherefore, by J. N. Gregory. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fort Concho Museum Board, a group of citizens, works to purchase, preserve, and restore the buildings of the fort, and collect the display items of interest that pertain to pioneer days in the Southwest. Up to the present time, the accomplishments of the board have been considerable. The items relating to pioneers have overflowed the administration building. Further space has been gained for them by the restoration of two barracks buildings and their mess halls on the north side of the quadrangle. The powder house, once located on the banks of the Concho River, has been removed and rebuilt stone by stone at a position just north of the restored barracks. The post chapel, beautifully preserved and a part of the museum, stands at the eastern end of Officers Row. Six of the original nine officers' homes have been bought by the board with money contributed by individuals and from small museum revenues. The old parade ground occupying the center of the quadrangle is marred and hidden from view by recent structures on its western end, and a large 1907 schoolhouse now occupies its center. A Comanche war party, assuming one existed today, one bent on the destruction of Fort Concho, would return, baffled, to its portable village for the simple reason that the Indians, like any other visitors, could not find Fort Concho, even though years back having been designated a National Historic Landmark. There are other buildings standing nearby that are owned and used today as warehouses by different San Angelo firms. Their beautiful stone, usually covered by applications of various colored stucco, but you can still identify them by their alignments and shapes. Some years back, the Santa Fe Railroad presented the city with one of its steam locomotives. This iron horse of bygone days is now resting on its rails near one of the restored barracks. It is a part of the museum and is a valuable item. Therefore, it is hoped that its longevity against the ravages of rust will be secured by the erection of a suitable structure over and around it. Now take your time and browse through the Fort Concho Museum, drive through the city over streets that bear the names of Beauregard, Mackenzie, Shafter, Grierson, and Chadbourne. It is all worth it, because without it there would soon be little to show us of the comparative life that existed in our southwest only a few short years ago. End of Part 4 Afterward End of Fort Concho, Its Why and Wherefore by J. N. Gregory